Hi everyone, I'm Maggie. I'm working on my anatomical certificate. And so today we are going to be going over the pelvis, including its osteology and musculature, the iliac arteries, the pelvic organs, including those in the urinary tract and the reproductive system, as well as the innervations of the pelvis. To get ourselves oriented, let's start with an overview of the osteology of the pelvis. The pelvis is made up of four bones two hip bones, the sacrum, and the coccyx. The hip bone, also known as the ox coxa, is made up of three bones that are fused together, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. The joints of the pelvis include the sacroiliac joint, intervertebral disc, and the pubic symphysis. Now let's go over some osteology landmarks. On the ox coxa, the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch are divided by the ischial spine. In this medial view, we can see the sacroiliac joint and the pubic symphysis, as well as the obturator foramen and the ischial pubic ramus. Here we have some slides talking about the osteology of the pelvis that we just went over, as well as the bony landmarks. There are several differences between male and female pelvises. A female pelvis will have an everted ischial tuberosities, a shallow and wide pelvic cavity, and false pelvis. A male pelvis, on the other hand, will have inverted ischial tuberosities, a narrow and deep pelvic cavity, and false pelvis. As we can see in the lower part of this picture, a female pelvis will have a wider subpubic angle, somewhere around 90 to 100 degrees, whereas a male pelvis will have a narrower subpubic angle, somewhere around 70 degrees. The pelvis can be divided into two regions, a greater and lesser pelvis. The greater pelvis is also known as the false pelvis. It contains the abdominal contents, ilium, and the cecum. The false pelvis is everything located above the superior pelvic aperture, which we can see as the purple shading in the top picture and as the red line in the bottom picture. The pelvic brim is the ring inside the pelvis. It is composed of the sacral promontory, arcuate line, and the iliopectinal line of the pelvis. We can imagine the pelvis as a bowl. The superior pelvic aperture is the opening of the bowl, and the pelvic brim is the rim of the bowl. The true pelvis, also known as the lesser pelvis, is contained between the superior and inferior pelvic apertures. The inferior pelvic aperture is covered by the urogenital diaphragm, which contains connective tissue, musculature, the anus, urethra, and vaginal orifices. Here we see an inferior view of the pelvis. This is the view that's similar to what a gynecologist would see when examining a patient. We can see how the pubic symphysis connects to the ischial pubic ramus, which connects to the ischial tuberosities, connecting to the sacrotuberous ligament, which then connects to the coccyx. These connections form the pelvic outlet, also known as the inferior pelvic aperture. In anatomical position, the ASIS and pubic symphysis are in the same vertical plane. This position naturally angles the pelvis forward. Because of this position, the superior pelvic aperture is tilted when compared to the inferior pelvic aperture. Here we see the different positions of the pelvis when it is being tilted. A posterior pelvic tilt is when the ASIS is posterior compared to the pubic symphysis. On the other hand, an anterior pelvic tilt is when the ASIS is anterior when compared to the pubic symphysis. While tilting is normal for movement, excessive or prolonged tilting can lead to abnormalities or pathologies. Attached to the bony landmarks of the pelvis are important connective tissues. The sacrotuberous ligament attaches from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity. The sacrospinous ligament attaches from the sacrum to the ischial spine. The sacrospinous ligament also forms the greater and lesser sciatic foramen. The obturator membrane forms the connection where the obturator internus will attach. 
There are small openings in the membrane that allow the obturator artery, vein, and nerve to pass through. Now let's do a quick overview of the musculature of the pelvis. The main muscles of the pelvis include the obturator internus, piriformis, coccygeus, and the levator ani muscles. The levator ani muscles are made up of three muscles, the iliococcygeus, pubococcygeus, and puborectalis. Here we can see the musculature of the pelvis from the, from the superior, inferior, and medial views. The inner surface of the oxcoxa is covered by the piriformis and obturator internus, which pass through the greater and lesser sciatic foramen. The piriformis attaches from the middle sacral segments to the greater trochanter. It is innervated by S1 and S2 and travels through the greater sciatic foramen. The obturator internus attaches from the obturator membrane to the greater trochanter. It travels through the lesser sciatic foramen. The obturator internus is innervated by L5, S1, and S2. Now we will move on to the musculature of the floor of the pelvis. Posteriorly, we have the coccygeus muscle. This muscle is just deep to the sacrospinal ligament. It attaches from the ischial spine to the lower sacrum and coccyx. It is innervated by S4. Anteriorly, we have the levator ani group, which attaches from the pubis and tendinous arch to the coccyx. As stated earlier, the three muscles that make up the levator ani are the iliococcygeus, pubococcygeus, and puborectalis. The levator ani muscles are innervated by S4 and the pudendal nerve. If we go back to our bowl analogy, the levator ani muscles form the bottom of the bowl. If we take a closer look at the levator ani muscles, we will see that the puborectalis muscle, shown here in red, goes around the rectum. When the puborectalis muscle contracts, it pinches off the rectum. This, along with other levator ani muscles, are important components in maintaining rectal continence. The levator ani muscles can weaken with age. So come fall when you see the cadavers, the levator ani muscles might not be completely visible. The muscles here can also tear during childbirth or activities such as heavy lifting. This occurs when increased abdominal pressure that occurs during certain lifts will push down on the muscles leading to tearing in a prolapsed rectum. This is extremely applicable in the case of pelvic floor physical therapy. It is important to maintain the functionality of these muscles and exercises such as Kegels and pelvic floor physical therapy treatment can increase the quality of life of patients struggling with incontinence. In this picture here, we can see that there are some differences in the levator ani muscles found in males and females. Females have more connective tissue gaps in the levator ani muscles than men. Here we see again the puborectalis muscle pinching off the rectum. In the picture to the right, we see the internal structure of the rectum. The pelvic floor divides the rectum from the anus. The bottom line shows where the location of the puborectalis muscle would be pinching off the rectum. The rectum also has transverse rectal folds. Now we are going to look at the internal structures of the pelvis. Pictured here is a hemisection of the female pelvis. Parietal peritoneum covers all of the pelvic organs in both the male and female pelvis. The draping of that peritoneum forms pockets or recesses which are named for what structures they are in between. In females, the rectouterine pouch, also known as the pouch Douglas, is between the rectum and the uterus. It is the lowest point in the peritoneum cavity in females when standing. The vesico-uterine pouch, aka the pouch marrying, is between the bladder and uterus. It's because the bladder is also a vesicle. A clinical significance to this is that infection can occur in the peritoneum and can easily been, be transmitted in the connective tissue. Notice the relationship between the structures and the pelvis and how easily it could be for that infection to pass from one organ to another due to their close location. And now for the male pelvis. First off, there's no uterus in the male pelvis, so that will change some of the names. We only have a rectovesical pouch, which is between the rectum and the bladder. Infection can also easily spread here because of the close relationship between those organs. Now we're going to talk about the iliac artery focusing on the internal branch. 
If we backtrack for a second and think of the abdominal aorta, it then terminates into the common iliac arteries. The common iliac arteries will then branch into the internal and external iliac arteries. The external iliac artery will become the femoral artery. The internal iliac artery will supply the pelvic organs. The internal iliac artery splits into two divisions. We have the posterior and anterior divisions. In the posterior region, we have the superior gluteal artery, which dives superior to the perform piriformis. That superior gluteal artery then gives off the iliolumbar and lateral sacral arteries. The iliolumbar artery heads up the lumbar region across the surface of the ilium, and the lateral sacral artery heads down the side of the sacrum. The posterior division of the internal iliac artery stays the same for both males and females. The anterior division is where we will see some differences across the sexes. So now onto the anterior division. The first artery that branches in the anterior division is the umbilical artery, which has several branches of its own. The umbilical artery goes to the umbilicus while in utero and it sends deoxygenated deoxygenated blood back to the placenta of the mother, but after birth, since it has no use, it will regress into a ligament. The two branches that it gives off are the superior vesicle artery, which supplies the bladder, and in the male, we have a ductus deferens artery coming off of the umbilical artery. The next branch we see is the obturator artery, which goes through the obturator foramen with the obturator nerve. Next, we have an inferior vesicle artery, which travels below the bladder. The middle rectal artery is next, which, as you guessed, goes to the middle portion of the rectum. The internal pudendal artery follows and goes behind the sacral ligament through the ischial anal fossa and supplies the genitals. Finally, we have the inferior gluteal artery, which travels below the piriformis and deep to the pelvic floor muscles. So as you've noticed, arteries are named for what they supply. However, in real life and not in pretty anatomy diagrams, there are variations in structure. In those cases, the arteries are also named for what they supply. This diagram here shows the typical pattern, which is seen in approximately 60% of people. Different slight variations will occur in the other 40% of the population. So now we have the female pelvis. It's mostly the same except for a few key differences. There's no artery of ductus deferens because females don't have a ductus deferens. They do have a uterus and a vagina, so we do have a uterine artery and a vaginal artery in the anterior division. They branch on either side of the inferior vesicle artery. The uterine, the uterine artery, inferior vesicle artery, and vaginal artery artery all head in the same direction. So in order to name the artery, you have to find what organ they are supplying first. Here are more depictions of the internal iliac artery. This is unfortunately just one of those topics in anatomy that you have to study on your own and your own preferred study method to get, whether that's drawing the branching pattern out, looking at different images, or writing out the path that the different arteries take. Just remember that there are slight variations between humans, and you'll encounter that in the fall when you're dissecting the cadavers. The arteries are named for what they're supplying, so if you can find what structure they're supplying and follow that artery back to see where it's coming from, you'll be able to come up with the name of the artery. In this picture, we have the pelvic and spinal cord veins. These veins provide an important pathway for things such as cancer or infection to enter the central nervous system. Prostate or cervical cancer can end up in the brain if it metastasizes and then travels through these veins to the spinal cord and brain. This is why prostate and cervical cancer can lend itself to neurological defects, paralysis, incontinence, and stroke-like symptoms. There are many different functionally important regions in the anal canal. The rectum extends down to this anal canal region where the columnar zone meets the anorectal junction. The columnar zone is interesting because the columns release olfactory molecules. When you see dogs sniffing each other's butts, it's because they secrete pheromones out of the columnar zone that help them communicate if they're feeling friendly or they're sick or they're happy. Humans can do this too because we still have those structures, but I don't recommend doing that out in the public. Below the column, we get to the smooth region of connective tissue that's called the anal pectin. 
Below that is the anocutaneous line. This is an important structure that differentiates the visceral rectum from the, the superficial cutaneous anus. Here we see a posterior view of the pelvis. The sacrum has been removed so that we can see the rectum. It's important to note that the rectum is drained by both the portal and cable systems. Different parts of the rectum will have different lymphatic drainage. The superior rectum drains into the inferior mesenteric and lymph nodes. The middle rectum goes into the internal iliac lymph nodes, and the anus drains into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. This slide here is an important diagram. It shows what changes from the rectum to the anus. We have the anocutaneous line in the dotted pink, which separates the two structures. The two structures have different arterial supply, venous and lymphatic drainage, and sensory and motory innervation. The annual cutaneous line also divides which structures will drain superficially through the cable system or drain internally through the portal system. This is a great slide that sums up the differences really well. So now we're going to move on to the urinary tract. Where the common iliac arteries bifurcate is where the two ureters will cross the pelvic brim after descending from the kidneys. In the female, the uterine artery will cross over the top of the ureter, whereas in the male, the ductus deferens will cross over the top of the ureter. The uterine artery and ductus deferens artery can be used as landmarks to help you identify the ureter. The bladder is like a three-sided pyramid. Some important landmarks on it are the apex, body, and fundus. The fundus can be thought of as the base of the pyramid and it will face the rectum in males and the uterus in females. The surface of the bladder is covered in peritoneum. The ureters will drain into the bladder and will extend to the sphincter vesicae in the neck of the bladder. We can now look on the inside of the bladder. Inside, we have the smooth surface named the trigone, and the rest of the bladder is made up of detrusor muscle. The bladder is parasympathetically innervated, which allows it to contract and expel urine out. The sphincter vesicae muscle is the smooth muscle portion at the neck of the bladder, which is innervated by sympathetic fibers. In order for the bladder to fill with urine, the sphincter vesicae must be contracted under sympathetic tone, but to expel urine out, you have to have parasympathetic tone. The process of potty training young children is teaching them how to control the autonomic functions. Here we take a look at the male urethra. The male urethra is longer and more complex than the female urethra. After, after the bladder is filled with urine, the urine is expelled and travels through the urethra. There are several different portions to the urethra. The prosthetic portion contains the urethra that is within the prostate. Then we have the membranous urethra that is in the pelvic floor. It goes from the inferior prostate to the bulb of the penis. It is surrounded by the sphincter urethra muscle. The spongy urethra is the portion that is inside the corpus spinogium of the pelvis. There are a couple accessory sexual organs along the urethra that are important. The prostate forms some of the seminal fluid that ends up getting ejaculated, as well as being a smooth muscle that facilitates ejaculation. The bulbal urethral glands produce lubrication fluid and prime the urethra for an influx of seminal fluid during ejaculation. Here we can see the female urethra. It terminates as an external urethral orifice inside the vestibular of the vagina. We can see that here in blue. The important thing to note here is that the female urethra is much shorter than compared to the male urethra, which is why females have a higher prevalence in having UTIs. Urinary tract infections happen when bacteria enters the urethra and travels and infects the urinary tract system. A shorter urethra means a shorter distance that bacteria has to travel, which means more UTIs. Clinically, there is a high prevalence of UTIs in nursing homes. That can be from a variety of reasons, including higher rates of dehydration, catheters, negligent nursing home staff, high rates of STDs, and a suppressed immune system. Sperm is formed in the testes, travels through the ductus deferens to the ampulla. 
The sperm is then stored in the prostate and seminal vesicles. In the picture on the right, we can see those structures as well as the bulbourethral glands. These accessory organs will atrophy with age. Prostate cancer is one of the most common tumors found in older men. Tumors are found posterior to the prostate. Because of their location, they can be palpated during a rectal exam, which is the most effective way to identify prostate cancer. Here's a picture of that. So now we're going to take a look at the female sexual organs. We have the uterus, vagina, ovaries, and uterine tubes. The uterus is suspended in the body by connective tissue. The picture here is showing the relationship between the ovaries and the ligament of the ovary, which extends from the uterus to the ovaries to keep them in place in the false pelvis. So the ovaries will release the eggs into the false pelvis and hope that the eggs float into the fimbrae, which pick up the eggs and then travel through the uterine tube. The uterine tube is composed of three different regions, the infibulum, ampulla, and isthmus. The isthmus is closest to the uterus and is the smallest portion. Now we're going to take a look at the uterus. We have the fundus on the posterior surface moving inferiorly. We have the body and the isthmus and most inferiorly we have the cervix. The cervix extends down into the vagina and has fornix around the opening of the cervix into the vagina. The uterus lies on top of the bladder. It is antiverted and antiflexed in relation to the bladder. The antiverted uterus means that the long axis of the whole uterus is bent forward in relation to the long axis of the vagina. The antiflexed uterus means that the long axis of the body of the uterus is bent forward in relation to the long axis of the cervix. The directions of antiversion and antiflex can be seen here in the red and blue lines. The vagina heads in a superior and posterior direction. It is continuous with the uterine cavity. The cervix protrudes into the vagina surrounded by anterior and posterior fornices. The vagina also has a distal opening into the perineum. Here we are looking at the broad ligament, which is the peritoneum that drapes over the uterus. It has different portions and names for the different regions and is named depending on what it's overlying. The anterior portion of the broad ligament extends over the bladder, while the posterior portion extends back towards the rectum. The portion that rests on top of the muscle of the uterus is called the mesometrium. The portion that drapes over the uterine tube is called the mesophalanx. And the portion that drapes over the ovaries is called the mesovarium. The ligaments of the uterus provide support to the uterus and passage for vessels traveling through the area. Besides the broad ligament, there is also the round ligaments, transverse cervical ligaments, uterosacral ligaments, and pubovesical ligaments. The ligaments are named for what they attach to. The uterosacral ligament heads posterior to attach on the sacrum, providing stability to the uterus. The pubovesical ligaments head around the bladder to the pubic bone. The round ligaments head through the inguinal canal and into the labia majora. And finally, the transverse cervical ligaments head out to the sides of the cervix surrounding the uterine vesicles. Now we're going to talk about the innervation of the pelvis. We can see here the lumbosacral plexus, which is made up of several ventral ramae that form plexuses. The lumbar plexus comes from T12 to L4 and supports the anterior thigh. The lumbosacral trunk is where L4 and L5 merge together and then pass over the pelvis to merge with the sacral plexus. The sacral plexus comes from S1 to S4 and provides motor and sensory innervation to the posterior thigh, lower leg, foot, some of the pelvis, and the perineum. The coccygeal plexus provides sensory innervation to the area around the coccyx. Branches from the sacral and coccygeal plexus will pass through the pelvic cavity, through the greater sciatic foramen, and into the gluteal region through the obturator foramen. Here we can see the nerves of the lumbosacral plexus. This is not quite as complex as the brachial plexus, so that's a wonderful thing. The lumbar plexus begins at T12 with the subcostal nerve. The subcostal nerve is below the last rib, hence the name subcostal. Then you have the iliohypogastric, ilinguinal, genitofemoral, and lateral femoral cutaneous nerves. The femoral nerve and obturator nerve are part of the lumbar plexus. 
Your sacral plexus forms the sciatic nerve down the back of the leg. The sciatic nerve is part common peroneal nerve and part tibial nerve. We can also see here the superior and inferior gluteal nerves. They run deep to the pelvis and out to the back. So we don't include them as part of the lumbar plexus because all of these other nerves head laterally and anteriorly, where the superior and inferior gluteal nerves head deep and posteriorly. The sacral splanchnic nerves carry sympathetic innervation to the pelvis structures. They contribute to the inferior hypogastric plexus, which innervates the pelvic viscera. The sacral splanchnic nerves travel alongside the internal iliac arteries. It's important to remember that the sacral splanchnic nerves carry sympathetic fibers. The pelvic splanchnic nerves carry parasympathetic fibers to innervate the abdominal viscera, pelvic organs, and erectile tissue in the perineum. So while the sacral splanchnic nerves carry sympathetic fibers, the pelvic splanchnic nerves carry par parasympathetic fibers. That is all I have for this pelvis lecture, so thank you.